I see. Okay. So, you know, in um, so uh, Carl, would you once again read nine through seven? I think it's seven. Whatever the end is. It's supposed to be nine through twelve. Huh? What's that? After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Why don't you, I'm feeling confident today. Why don't you go through the end of the chapter? <laughs> then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Very good. That's good news. In case in case people missed it, <laughs> that's 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 good news. You know that that almost should be any time. I would think that any time you were talking to something on things spiritual and they come around to Jesus, you know that we would say, and I don't even think about this, but that we would say, let me read you something. You know, and it just seems like that passage there, if nothing else would tell people, regardless of how mad you may be at God, and that's why you resist, here's what God has promised. You know? I mean, th that that's a promise that's there. That it's actually happening now for those people that have gone, gone before us. You know? I mean, that's... That's good. I think I think a lot of times we just read over stuff like that and go, yeah, sounds good. And you know, and we move on. You know, we don't really let it sink into us that each day that we would wake up, and like I say, I'm as guilty as anybody. You know, each day that we wake up and we go, that promise is for me. You know, no matter what issues I'm going through in my life now or my family's going through, you know, whatever, that promise is for me. It's for us. You grab onto it and then. Get on with your day. So one of those guys who's in that great cloud of witnesses, that great multitude, I spoke about him last week a little bit, is um, uh, Bishop Melito. I don't know if you remember, we talked about him, just, uh, just bringing up about just that people were thinking the things of God and of Jesus back in the second century. And this guy was pretty clear on what he thought about. He was the Bishop of Sardis. You know, we had talked about Sardis, you know, in the seven, you know, of the seven churches. So this guy was, you know, the Bishop of Sardis uh, into the second century, uh, you know, probably, let's say if he was born in, I think he was born in 80, he died in 180. So it was a hundred. So say, say in the hundred and twenties, hundred and thirties, maybe, you know, later now, you know, he was the bishop there at the church of, church of Sardis. But, you know, we're coming up to Easter, you know, we get tied up in Lent. So we, you know, it's like, you can't talk about Easter until you get Lent over, you know, but, you know, to me, Good Friday is the holiest of the days in the calendar. You know, because that's where the work of Jesus was done. You know, whatever, the, going from Genesis 3 
all the way through the scriptures to the um, to the cross led up to that point in time. You know, now the resurrection, now you can't separate them. That's the thing with Holy Week. You can't separate the events of Holy Week because it's one thing. But I think if you're going to pick a pinnacle, it's on Good Friday. He has a point. Melito made a point here. He said, speaking of Jesus, he said, and so he was raised on a cross and a title was fixed, indicating who it was who was being executed. Painful it is to say, but more terrible not to say, he who suspended the earth is suspended. He who fixed the heavens is fixed. He who fastened all things is fastened to the wood. The master is outraged. God is murdered. Oh, I mean, <laughs> you can't say it more bluntly, you know, than that. I mean, one, who Jesus is, he's God. And that he was murdered on a cross. Yeah, like that. So I think Melito is my new favorite church father. Like that. You know, until last week, last week when I, I ran into whatever we talked about last um, week about him, and I had never heard of him before. But I think he's my new, um, I think he's my new favorite. Yes, sir. If I'm not Andy, mistaken, do your microphone. If I'm not mistaken, I think we have a Supreme Court justice right now by the name of Alito. Well, it's Alito, but this is Melito. It's not a question. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. M-E-L-I-T-O, Melito. Bishop of Sardis it's in the second century. You know, so, you know, if... You know, so if you've got John writing um, the Revelation, say anywhere from right before 70, 95, wherever people want to put it, and this guy's born in 80, and, you know, he's, I mean, he's soon after, you know, say, say we're talking, let's see, you got to be 30, so this ain't going to be 30, say 50. But we're talking, if we're talking 130, and if John died in 100, I mean, 30 years ago, so what was 30 years ago from right now? 1994. I mean, we remember people from, I mean, wise people from 1994. And if somebody were a, um, you know, a student of theirs or, you know, like that, I mean, those things are, you know, are fresh in our, fresh in our minds. So we talked we talked about verse nine. Now, let me just read it. Just say, after this, I look and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all the tribes of people, languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. So they're it's a great number. They're from every nation, from all the tribes, peoples, languages. Um, they're standing before the throne of God. So this is, I mean, the God's people are from all over, okay? At one time, they were pretty much just from Israel. Yeah. But through the time, through the binding of Satan, because it said, you know, Satan's bound so that he can no longer deceive the nations, all of these people, the harvest has come in of people. So you got all those people from all over, and they're standing before the throne before the Lamb. So there's two things. One, they're standing before the throne, and we know that the Lamb is at the throne, okay? And they're clothed in white robes. You know, white robes talk about purity, and, you know, they've been cleansed, you know? And then later on, it's going to say, I think in that second section that I had Carl read, it says that they made their robes white by oh, dipping them in the blood. <laughs> you know, that's kind of a little counterintuitive, you know, there, and it says with palm branches in their hands, you know, and, you know, whether this is a reference to, um, uh, you know, to Palm Sunday, you know, the entry of Jesus into the city, that could be palm branches were used in the Old Testament also. It's just that it's not that they just happen to have palm branches. The palm branches mean something. Carl. 
it wasn't just blood that they washed him in, it was blood of the lamb. Blood of the lamb, yeah. Oh, get technical on me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's not it's not just blood because the blood was from the sacrifices of all the animals that really did no good other than foreshadow the blood of the lamb. So that's a good point. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Well, the other thing, too, is yeah. the individual watched the world in the yeah. blood of the lamb. No, yeah. they were. And they didn't come out of the dry cleaner, the blood dry cleaner. <laughs> Could you imagine opening up a dry cleaning place in town called the Blood Dry Cleaning? <laughs> be kind of an be kind of an inside joke type of a thing, like that. So anyway, um, you know, and then again, it goes into you know we're not going to get into it so much right now, but I mean, it gets into you know what is the blood? I mean, because uh, you know, when the children of Abraham say that they're the children of Abraham, they're not talking, and it's not being talked about as blood relations of Abraham. You know, it's spirit children of Abraham through Jesus Christ and his blood. Right. There's a story about a, a lamb that was bitten in the face by a rattlesnake. And the owner of the of the lamb was worried, but come to realize that the blood of the lamb is actually used as a serum against the poison of the snake. Mm -hmm. Oh, as a serum. I I missed that word. That's what I was trying to mm -hmm. was trying to clarify. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. How, how are we gonna How are we gonna use the blood of the lamb? It's what works, and it's the only thing that works. You know, so we can, um, you know, make symbolism out of the blood. We can make metaphors, you know, whatever. Or we just take it as that liquid stuff that comes out of people, you know. But whatever it is, it's the only thing that works. The blood from Jesus. Dr. John. In the Old Testament, life is in the blood. Life is in the blood. And life is in the blood right yeah no you know and it's i mean it's just a, a a string that just goes throughout the whole you know the whole scriptures and it manifests itself on the cross like that like i say the cross is that you know it's that focal point you know when it says that um at one point when jesus is out with his disciples i don't remember the exact uh place where it is but it says that he turned his face towards Jerusalem. He, it's at that point that they've been doing all their ministry out there. And it says that he, in fact, it says something like he turned his face like granite towards Jerusalem. And it's at that point that he's made, not that he's made the decision, because that's always been a part of the plan. But that's that definitive moment that he's going to the cross, even though it may be 10 chapters away or whatever, you know, whatever it is. It's just that it's making that point is, okay, we've done all of this, and now we're going to do this. It says he turned his face like a flint, I think, in one of the translations. Not in common in all the translations, but it, you know, it says he turned his face like a flint towards Jerusalem. Something like that. I, I could be butchering it. but So in verse 10, it says, crying out. Now, remember, these people, all these people, white robes, palm branches, and all that. They cry out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our Lord, to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Um, you know, this is just that same worshiping church that we had in chapters four and five, you know, when John was first called up to heaven to see a vision, and he saw the Father sitting on the throne, and then the you know, the sun comes and takes the scroll and all the cherubim and elders and whoever all that is are doing all the hallelujahs and that that's the same church. But salvation does not belong to us, but to God. We received his salvation, okay? And um, 
in the Psalm 95, it says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make joyful noise with him with great song and praise. So these people who are worshiping are doing what 95 says, but he says, he's the rock of our salvation. Like that, so... You know, it's not like salvation is something that we muster up or, you know, it's like faith. You know, people seem to think, you know, faith is something that we muster up. You know, we tell people, if you had enough faith, and that's that's not where faith comes from. It doesn't come from, okay, let me try harder. Does that mean if I pray, if I close my eyes and clench my fists, I'm doing it, you know, harder? No, it comes from God. You know, it's God that gives us all of those things that we that we need. It's by his grace that we're saved by faith and not faith that comes from ourselves, but that he has given to us. You know, it says in Ephesians 2, you know, so, yeah, so it's just what we receive from God, not what we not what we muster up. So what you do, hang on just a second, Joe. You know, so what we do is we do the things that God told us. We look for assurance and faith in those places where God told us to, in his word, in his sacraments, in in our Bible studies, in our communion with each other, and stuff like that. And if we do those things, it's there that God delivers that faith to us, delivers that salvation to us. You know, our salvation is being delivered all the time. Yeah. Okay, Deacon Joe. Yeah, I think you really nailed it on the on the head there about the general populace looks at it as a work we do. Yeah. And it's God's work, God's work alone by grace yeah. alone. But you hear it in the voice when people will say things like, Well, I found God. Mm -hmm. You know, well though no, God wasn't lost. I was gonna say, yeah, yeah. that's a, yeah. Um, and the other word that's frequently used is I accepted his grace yeah. as if it was my responsibility yeah. to take action. So I like the use of the word receive. Right. Very well. right. But you know what? A lot of that stuff is the church's fault, too, yeah. because the way we as a church people, the way we present it, it's almost like, you know, someone says, I don't have enough faith. They go, well, if you would go out and do this, whatever it might be. Like, you do like, yeah, if you go out and do something, you'll find the faith. You'll find God. You'll find the salvation. So they do, and then they come back, and they go, I looked. I didn't I didn't find. Instead of just, just submit and receive. Like, you know, it's, a, it's the old thing. I, I heard this years ago. Maybe I'd take it out of the context of whoever, you know, said it. But they say, you know, it's not, if I see, I'll believe. So if I believe, I'll see. You know, so which comes first? You know, so, and it's a, it's it's hard. And we get lost in language, and you know, people end up by talking sloppy. I do the same thing. You know, you talk sloppy, you get a point across, but you really said it wrong, and it may have left the wrong impression with the, you know, with the person. Maybe that's happening right now. I don't know. Pastor Calio, do your microphone. Right. So, so, but anyway, she was upset because grace was left out completely. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's hard. I mean, I, I you know, in the Roman Catholic Church, that is their doctrine. Yeah. Like that. But it's their doctrine, but I don't know that they really, really believe it that way. You know, like, but, it, but those are the words that they use. And so now it's a matter of what people receive when they hear it. You know, you talk to Roman Catholic people, like lay people. Like that, because I don't know what a priest would say. But you talk to lay people and you go, if you were to die today, what it is, what is it that gets you into heaven? And they would almost all say, it's Christ. They might add something there, 
you know, but they would almost all say it's Jesus. But if you have them repeat back to church doctrine, they're, it's going to be heavy on the works, you know, because that's what they get trained with. But I think deep down, they know. I mean, I think they deep down know, like we do, that we're all scoundrels in our own way. And Ray, and then we'll move on. Yeah. 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 It's 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 too it's too bad. It's too bad that people and hey, it happens in Protestant churches just as much, you know, like that. It's because people have been led to believe that there's something that they that they're supposed to do that they're not doing, you know, so. They, and it's tough in this world because in the world, you get rewarded for what you do. You know, you have a job. How do you get rewarded? Do you get rewarded just by sitting there and being unnoticed? Or do you make yourself noticed so you get the reward? And, that, and, and Christianity is probably the only thing in life where it doesn't work that way, you know. Deacon right. Dennis. Well, oftentimes people think, well, it can't be that simple. There's nothing more to it than what you tell them. Yes. No. You would be saved. Yeah. You would be believed. Right. Well, there's got to be more. There's got to be a hook. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where you have to make it clear, though, is when you tell somebody, yeah, there's nothing that you can do. It's all free gift. But once you receive the gift, this is the way that. A gift receiver lives their life, you know, like that. But uh, but either the grace part gets left off, or you give them all grace and you forget to let them know how a Christian's supposed to live. Doesn't earn their salvation, doesn't help them keep their salvation, but it's just the way they're supposed to live. So anyway, so um, so what is salvation? Oh wait, wait let me see here. Um, Let's see. Mm, <clears throat> well, let's move down to what is salvation. You know, uh, you know, it's deliverance from sin, death, and Satan. You know, all the evils of the body and the soul that go with it. That's what your salvation is. It's delivered you from that. Thing is, is that as people, we want to go back to it. You know. It's just, you know, it's just in our nature. So that's why you got to live that life of repentance. I, I was reading something today, this morning, that somebody had said, you know, at Lent, this is a time of repentance, you know, of putting on the sackcloth and ashes and, you know, a, a time of repentance. But really for a Lutheran, every day is a time of repentance. Every day is Lent. You know, and that's one, that's the first, that's the first um, thesis from Luther in the 95 thesis, that we live a life of continued repentance. So technically, for Lutheran, I don't know about the other groups, but for Lutheran, it's um, Lent every day. Dr. John. Luther says we're all beggars. Yeah. 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 So, and it's just a matter of, I, I guess it's just a matter of realizing that we're beggars, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, so um, anyway, so they're going to be restored. So verse 11 says, and all the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders, around the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped, you know, worshiped God. So you've got all of these um, heavenly creatures, you know, the angels, uh well, the elders, I don't know who the elders is. I don't know who if the elders are part of that. Well, they're part of the great multitude because they're even the angels are part of the great multitude and all that. But anyway, but as a part of worship, all you can do is just um, fall on your face. The the church, in my notes are the church is not alone. We have angels, you know, so that's a, you know, that's a good thing. Um, and this is what you have happen when you come to the divine worship service. We talked about last week, Pastor Skip talked about uh, the, uh, when, when you guys talked about the chancel area, um, uh, the rail, you know, going from wall and around to wall to connect it to what's on the other side of the wall 
which are the heavenly saints. The saints are already in heaven that we're communing and worshiping with them. There's just that thin veil between, um, you know, heaven and heaven and earth, and so that's um, so that's what that's what's happening. The um, I don't know if I read this um, where it says uh, Hebrews in Hebrews twelve. There it says. I think it's in your notes. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in fest festal gatherings, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks of a better word than the blood of Abel. So he's talking to the church on earth, but he's tying it to that church in heaven because Jesus is that, you know, leads that priesthood of, um, you know, of the believers up there. So again, there's not two churches, it's one church, but it's just divided by that you know, um, veil. Uh, it's just one. So remember that Sunday. Uh, maybe I said that last week. <laughs> remember that Sunday as we, um, you know, go to worship service. That, you know, uh, you know, the, you know, you got the angels and the archangels and, you know, all of creation that's there assembled in our sanctuary. He said there are other sanctuaries too, but I mean, it's all there, but it's all there. It's not just us sitting next to, you know, us sitting next to each other. Pardon? All the company of heaven. Yeah, all the company of heaven is, you know, is there. It's hard for us to understand, but I think if you get, just remember that Sunday or Saturday or Sunday. I don't know if Saturday is as holy as Sunday, but anyway, but just, <laughs> <laughs> but just, you know, when you sit down before the service starts, when you sit, just kind of gaze around and, you know, and look at and make yourself realize that it's all, all the heavenly hosts are there. You know, so it's not just uh, Pastor Skip and Deacon Joe. <laughs> so, so it says, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. And again, that's that praise from the angels and all those others um, <clears throat> that are there. Yeah. And here we have, I've gotten your notes that we have sevenfold worship of God. You know, you have to watch closely because it ha in the Greek it contains the definite article for each thing. So what it's saying is, um, it says the blessing, talking about the blessing, the glory, the wisdom, the thanksgiving, the honor, the power, the might. I mean, it's it's a definite something. It's not just a laundry list of um, you know uh, of things. See what it says here in this in in the um, what do you call it in the ESV? They just have blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power. But I looked it up in the Greek and it's got the 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 in front of each one, so it's a definite something, not just a general something. Hudson, I count only six there. Let me see. What what was I got. Power and might. Oh, my. Yeah. Might and power seem kind of the same. Hey, you have, to, you have to take that up with the Holy Spirit. He put the words in. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, yeah, I just want to watch that one watch the time here. Let me see where we're going to get here. Okay, so that was... um. Well, that was verse, okay, so that was verse, um, you know, verse, we go into verse 13 here. It says, then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? You know, imagine this, you know, John's sitting there probably with his jaw hanging down, trying to figure out what's happening. And here you have one of the elders 
coming up to him and saying, hey, who are these clothes in the white robes and, you know, and where have they come from? Like, John's going to know, you know? So, um, and I said to him, sir, you know, he probably said, I hope you know. <laughs> he says, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. And we talked about that um, a little bit earlier. So when John says, sir, you know, what he's actually saying is, heck if I know. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, I'm just trying to figure it out. But there's a present tense that's used um, for those coming out of the Great Tribulation. Uh, you know, what do I have here? It says, what creates the Great Tribulation? Well, we find this here. Wherever Christ is preached causes tribulation. Causes, no, in our country, we're probably a little more refined. I think I said this a couple of weeks ago, because people in America really don't care. I don't care what you believe, you know, just because I'm too busy. You know, I don't care. But in other countries, they care about what you believe. And if you believe wrong, they want to take you out. Now, it may be becoming more and more like that in America, but it's not like, I mean, IHOP lets us come in here and, you know, <laughs> lets us come in here and do that. Okay, but it may come a day where, you know, IHOP goes woke or whatever, and they're not allowed to, and this is a restaurant, they can do what they want, you know, okay. but I mean, it, where you're not allowed to gather uh, so freely, like that, Deacon Dennis. You can call your God anything that you want, as long as it isn't Jesus Christ. I know. When you say Jesus Christ, the flags all go up, stand by. Yep. Nobody, I mean, nobody cares. If somebody comes up and says, I'm a Buddhist, nobody cares. <laughs> I'm, I'm ser no, I'm serious. In fact, in fact, what you get is a lot of Christians who will say, yeah, you know, I'd like to meditate on that Zen stuff myself. I mean, they don't realize that conflict, you know, that's, you know, that's in there, but... Um, yeah, when you especially if you say, I believe in Jesus, and here's what that means for you. I mean, you better duck and run. <laughs> Pastor. It's a good lead in for our event at the church tonight at six o'clock for the, the Christians in the Middle East that are persecuted and yeah. their testimonies of six to eight o'clock tonight. Yeah. Well, look, like the way he slips in those commercials. <laughs> and now a word from our sponsor. <laughs> anyway, so let's let's move on. Let me let me finish this. So he says, uh, now you know they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the land. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them in his presence. I mean, that's what. You know, that we talked about that church triumphant, those who have gone ahead of us. This is what they're doing right now. You know, is they're praising God, but it's God that's still covering and preserving them after they've come out of their uh, time of, you know, time of tribulation and that. Anyway, so verses 15 and 17, I have this in your notes, a picture of all who are in Christ, the entire church of all time, and in all places, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching, you know, any scorching heat. You know, and this would be part of any kind of a funeral or memorial service, you would think, is to reassure the families that those people are in God's presence and they're being protected and that they will shall hunger no more, um, you know, neither thirst no more, uh, you know. What whatever the issue might be, huh? oh, uh, Doctor John. Looking at uh, the commentary that yeah. Ruth on Revelation, he makes the point here: it's important to know that the church does not remain in tribulation. Does not right? Yeah, the command, the command of tribulation. There's a there's an end in sight that we all need to, um, you know, that we all need to realize. That's that it's great hope. That's that great hope. And like I said earlier, 
if we just woke up each morning and reminded ourselves, like what that verse, those verses in nine, uh, verses nine to 12, you know, we're talking about and keep that in the back of your mind. That should get you through your, you know, through your day. So he says, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from every eye. Let me see. I was, you know, I'm trying to, well, I got, maybe I'll pick up. I had a, a separate note in there to wrap up that chapter. I think I'll do it next week because we're getting late on time. We will go into chapter eight next week. Chapter eight starts, you know, we have the six, or the seven seals, and now we're going to have the seven trumpets coming up. Okay. Um, anybody online have any questions or thoughts or? Nope. Okay. Well, you Good guys to be all... with you. What's that? It's good to be with you. Oh, good to be with us. Yeah. yeah. You guys can hear better because you guys are getting it coming out there like that. Are you guys getting all settled in, Jerry? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. So where did Deacon Dennis go? Oh, Deacon Dennis. Uh, Deacon Dennis went to the old man's room. Yeah. So we're going to sing, My faith looks up to thee. I don't know if I know that one. Yeah, so yeah. 